Well, good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on trauma as a root cause. We've been having some last-minute email questions from people wanting to join, so we're excited to offer today's webinar and uh, welcome everyone to it. Now, today's webinar, just to give you some background and context for it, it's one in a series of free webinars that Equiate hosts every month. We do it as a service to those who work in the field addressing health and social problems. And if this is your first introduction to Equiate, let me just briefly introduce our company. We're a relatively new organization, a consulting firm based in Alberta, Canada. Our focus is on solving social problems uh, with a particular emphasis on equity and the health or social gradient. And if you've been following the news, you know, Alberta's got a fair amount of uh, flooding recently. Uh, nothing close to where I am, but we're heading up to Calgary on Saturday to, to do some cleanup. It's pretty unbelievable when you see the scope and the scale of what's happening. I'll just spend a minute orienting you to the webinar interface. Uh, you, you'll see the slides on the screen. And um, I'm just getting a question here. I can't hear anything. How do I switch the phone? Great question. So at the top of the interface, uh, you'll see a phone icon and a My Mood icon. If you click on the My Phone icon, it will give you the audio options where you can switch between your computer and the telephone. That's how you do that. If you hover over your mouse over the My Mood icon, it will show you some options there. Uh, yes, thumbs up, no thumbs down, raising your hand, you know, saying you're fine. fine. And when we get to the question and answer portion of today's webinar, um, we'll use the raising hand function there just to indicate you have a question. Somebody else is commenting, if you unmute, unmute your computer, you'll be able to hear everything. Uh, that was the issue they had. Let's just do a quick check and make sure uh, this is working. If you could go to My Mood and then click on the Thumbs Up uh, button there. Perfect. Following along perfectly. Okay. And when we get to the question and answer section, there's two ways that we can do that. One is if you're Participating by computer, sometimes the audio is a bit difficult to, to hear. So if you have a question, you can ask it um, out loud through your computer or, or through the phone. You can switch to a phone connection if you have a question. Or you can type your question into the chat window that's on the screen there, and we'll, uh, we'll get to it that way. So either way works fine when we get to the question and answer section. So thank you again for joining us today. I think today's webinar is a very important one. For some of you, trauma may be part of your day-to-day -day work. But for many, like myself, we work in fields where trauma is almost an invisible concept. It's not really talked about, measured, acknowledged, or paid attention to. Yet it's there, influencing so many aspects as the root cause of what we are dealing with in healthcare, public health, mental health, addictions, and other areas. I'd like to say, too, trauma is deep and challenging. I'd like to acknowledge that at the beginning, and also acknowledge that in today's webinar, we'll only be able to touch on aspects of trauma that deserve so much more than the attention we will be able to give them in the next hour. My own interest in trauma began in the area of Aboriginal health as part of the historical context that is at the roots of so many of the disparities we see in Aboriginal health status today. We'll come back to this with examples in later parts of today's webinar. But first, I'd like to share a story. The story of a pediatrician who came to understand the significant role trauma played in the health and health disparities in her patient population. Dr. Nadine Burke is a pediatrician practicing in the inner city of San Francisco. She came to Edmonton about two years ago and spoke as part of an event hosted by the Institute of Health Economics and Alberta Health Services and told her story there. So her story is as follows. After completing her residency, she began work on reducing health disparities in San Francisco and created an inner city clinic where the disparities were the greatest in her community. In her practice, children were being referred to her by the schools because of their bad behavior with the request to prescribe Ritalin to treat ADHD. So Dr. Burke would uh, 
do a history and gather information about the child. And she discovered, these are all true stories that she related, one child's mom was paranoid schizophrenic and had recently driven their car into a building. One child's dad was incarcerated. Another child's dad was facing deportation. Another child had witnessed an attempted murder. And these were all real examples, either at home or in the community. But these children's behavior was not ADHD at all. It was on the trauma spectrum. Now, Dr. Burt commented on this. and She said, I worked in the community and I saw a whole bunch of kids who had tuberculosis or HIV or something else. I would do my research and figure out and become an expert on that topic. It turns out that adverse childhood experiences was a thing that I received no training on during residency, but was the number one thing impacting the children I was seeing. Note that she had received no training. Trauma and adverse childhood events were invisible to the medical system she was trained in and familiar with. So Dr. Burke did her research, and in it she came across the ACES study, many of you are probably familiar with, led by Dr. Felit and Onda in Kaiser, San Diego. This study looked at over 17,000 adult participants and asked about their adverse childhood events. Now, in identifying adverse childhood events, these were the criteria. This is what they looked for. Recurrent physical abuse, recurrent emotional abuse, contact sexual abuse, an alcohol or drug abuser in the household, an incarcerated household member, someone who was chronically depressed, institutionalized, or suicidal, a mother treated violently, a house with one or no parents, or the parents divorced, or emotional or physical neglect. There were nine criteria they looked at. These were their ACEs criteria, the adverse childhood events they were asking their adult population about. Now, in this study, they found that as the number of ACEs increased, the risk for the following health problems increased in a strong and graded fashion. And by graded, it means the more ACEs somebody had, the higher their risk for the health condition. And look at this list. Alcoholism and alcohol abuse, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, depression, fetal death, health-related quality of life, illicit drug use, heart disease, liver disease, uh, risk for intimate partner violence, multiple sexual partners, sexually transmitted diseases, smoking, suicide attempts, unintended pregnancies, early initiation of smoking, early initiation of sexual activity, adolescent pregnancy. The risk increased for a broad spectrum of things, risky behaviors, mental health, chronic diseases, quality of life. All across the board, ACEs were shown to increase the risk of numerous varied health conditions. Now, to make this example more concrete, they found if you had four or more adverse childhood experiences in comparison to someone who had zero, you were found to be 260% more likely to have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, 240% more likely to have hepatitis, 250% more likely to have an STD, 460% more likely to have depression, 1,220% more likely to be suicidal, and 4,600% more likely to experience IV drug use. For those with seven or more ACEs, they found a 360% increase in the risk for heart disease, which is higher, by the way, than the risk of smoking, cholesterol, or high blood pressure, which are conventionally accepted risk factors for heart disease. And our medical system, by and large, does not screen or assess for adverse childhood experiences. Dr. Burke prevalence of ACEs in her pediatric patient population, looking for evidence of trauma in the chart history they'd recorded. She found a prevalence rate of 48%. Now, when she started her clinic and her program, her public health department had told her that the number one problem for her patient population was asthma, with a prevalence of 18%. Even overweight and obesity, and here's a map here of the Canadian provinces, we can't see the data, but the rates are just high, as we know. Overweight and obesity, which is widely touted as a leading risk factor for children, 
in adult health today only affected 37% of her patient population. Trauma affecting 48% of her pediatric population was her number one issue, and the health system wasn't set up to screen it, count it, or treat it. And, mind you, this was only major and significant traumas. They weren't even looking at moderate or mild traumas and their possible impacts. Now, Dr. Burke, in telling her story, comments on this. He said, if I'm out here trying to develop something to reduce health disparities, number one, we don't even screen for this. We don't even quantify it. How can we come up with a community health intervention when we're not even assessing this currently? After doing their chart review, they found that 73% of their kids had an ACEs score of one or more, and 14% had a score of four or more. Now, knowing what they knew from the ACEs study, they knew that the 14%, they already knew their future health outcomes. And this is the group they targeted for their intervention. Now, what they developed was a multidisciplinary approach to treatment that could serve these kids in their difficult situation. It was multidisciplinary rounds. People from different disciplines would come and talk about a child and how they could meet their needs and their health care needs and their broader needs, too. The protocol they developed is they screen for ACEs now when children first come to the clinic. If a child is screened and it has four or more ACEs, they're automatically referred to these multidisciplinary rounds. If a child has one to three ACEs but has symptoms, they refer them as well. The goal is trying to disconnect the path between ACEs and adverse health outcomes. Now, they're to be commended for their work, as are others who are addressing this issue. But the tragedy is there are too few like them. Trauma, generally speaking, is off the radar in healthcare and public health. This is becoming harder and harder to excuse the more we study it and the more we become aware of it. But it still seems to be invisible, yet in plain view. When you study the literature, trauma has been linked to early childhood development, Aboriginal well-being, poverty, sexual abuse, veterans health, COPD, cancer, diabetes, hepatitis, overweight and obesity, sleep disturbance, and sexually transmitted infections. There's more. That's just the smallest. What this means is that if you're working on any of these issues, you may well benefit from paying attention to trauma as a possible root cause of what you are seeing, screening for it, counting it, and figuring out how to treat it. And even more insidious than its reach is that, like an infectious disease, trauma and its effects can transmit between people and even across generations. And we'll come back to that point later. So what is trauma? Dr. Judith Herman, in her seminal book on the topic, describes trauma as an affliction of the powerless, overwhelming the ordinary systems of care that give people a sense of control connection, and meaning, generally involving threats to life or bodily integrity or a close personal encounter with violence or death, confronting human beings with the extremities of helplessness and terror, a feeling of intense fear, helplessness, loss of control, and threat of annihilation. Dr. Herman continues, and she describes the biology that creates trauma. And as she goes through this description, I'll read the quote to you, Note the similarities between trauma and the fight-or-flight stress response that's been identified as key to understanding health disparities in many different contexts. So here's her quote. Traumatic events generally involve threats to life or bodily integrity or a close personal encounter with violence and death. They confront human beings with the extremities of helplessness and terror and evoke the responses of catastrophe. The common denominator of psychological trauma is a feeling of intense fear, helplessness, loss of control, and threat of annihilation. The ordinary human response to danger is a complex, integrated system of reactions encompassing both body and mind. Threat initially arouses the sympathetic nervous system, causing the person in danger to feel an adrenaline rush and go into a state of alert. Threat also concentrates the person's attention on the immediate situation. In addition, threat may alter ordinary perceptions. People in danger are often able to disregard hunger, fatigue, or pain. 
Finally, threat evokes intense feelings of fear and anger. These changes in arousal, attention, perception, and emotion are normal adaptive reactions when faced with danger. Traumatic reactions occur when action is of no avail. When neither resistance nor escape is possible, the human system of self-defense becomes overwhelmed and disorganized. Each component of the ordinary response to danger, having lost its utility, tends to persist in an altered and exaggerated state long after the actual danger is over. Traumatic events produce profound and lasting changes in physiological arousal, emotion, cognition, and memory. Moreover, traumatic events may sever these normally integrated functions from one another. The traumatized person may experience intense emotion, but without clear memory of the event, or may remember everything in detail, but without emotion. They may find themselves in a constant state of vigilance and irritability without knowing why. Traumatic symptoms have a tendency to become disconnected from their source and to take on a life of their own. End of quote. That's a long quote. Let's break that quote down. Let's break the definition down. First is the normal fight-or-flight response to danger or stress. The body's hormones kick into gear and the body's on alert. We know from health equity research that one of the reasons poverty and other conditions are so harmful to health and well-being is that this state of fight or flight becomes persistent or chronic. What is natural in response to danger or stress is unnatural and harmful when the stress never leaves and the body's systems keep firing, aging the body's organs and weakening the immune system so that people affected in this way get more of whatever sickness is going around. It doesn't matter what it is. Now, trauma, by comparison, occurs when action in the form of resistance or escape is impossible and the human system of self-defense is overwhelmed and disorganized. Remember the definition it is a feeling of intense fear, helplessness, loss of control, and threat of annihilation. So it seems that, way, that while health and health disparities trace their causes to the stress response and its predictors, trauma is a much further extreme of that experience where the stress response isn't just in response to life circumstances and risks, but returning to the definition, affects and is affected by threats to life or bodily integrity or a close personal encounter with violence or death. Now, in Dr. Herman's description of the biological reactions related to trauma, the last point she mentioned was that, in quote, traumatic symptoms have tendency to become disconnected from their source and to take on a life of their own, unquote. Now, this helps to create the situation where parent, patients present with symptoms that appear to be self-contained, but in reality have at their root the experience of trauma. Remember Dr. Burke's pediatric clinic. Kids are being referred to her for behavioral symptoms that had at their root the experience of trauma. Now, unless it's screened for and counted, we won't know it's there, and we'll continue to face the challenge of chasing all of its clinical sequelae. Now, we discussed trauma and trauma as a root cause briefly. Now, let's visit trauma in a First Nations context, and then we'll turn to healing from trauma and exploring a public policy framework for trauma. Now, trauma is a particular concern in First Nations or Indigenous populations. While well, this isn't the only context or population where trauma is active, First Nations or Indigenous peoples have been and continue to be particularly affected by trauma and intergenerational trauma stemming from colonization in its various forms. The colonization can be characterized as a loss of control and sovereignty. Now, control of destiny is increasingly being recognized as an important concept for health and health disparities. And it ties into trauma, as we discussed earlier. It's a loss of control. In an Aboriginal context, from prior to the history of treaty making up to the present day, the loss of control over their own destiny and efforts to regain it has been a defining characteristic of this experience. A loss of control was mentioned as one of the feelings that would come through traumatic experiences, as defined earlier by Dr. Herman. The Aboriginal Healing Foundation, they've published wonderful research one of their reports describes the relationship between control of destiny and trauma through the lens of learned helplessness. Now, summarized in this report, 
Learned helplessness occurs when an individual or a group perceives that his or her behavior cannot control events and that no action on his or her part will control outcomes in the future. Moreover, if the traumatic experience should endure across time, in the Aboriginal context, through three major periods of colonization and 400 years of epidemics, and should be applicable across settings or areas of impact, such as physical, economic, cultural, and social, then failure in the present should create generalized expectations for failure in the future. Eventually, via the learned helplessness phenomenon, the trauma enters into the psychological makeup of people. In consequence, even if a person finds himself or herself in a situation where she or he could act and react to outside forces or opportunities, she or he fails to make any attempt to do so. So the degree of control over one's destiny appears to be related to the degree of trauma experienced. Now the idea of hope is of interest here as a possible antidote, and we include this in our discussion of what to do about trauma later in the webinar. So where did this trauma come from in the First Nations context? Let's discuss residential school as one cause. Now in Canada, the Indian Act legally removed the rights of Aboriginal parents to their children, giving the government total control over the children's lives. For over a century, under the authority of Indian agents and enforced by the RCMP, Aboriginal children were taken from their families and incarcerated in residential schools. There was no recourse for the parents, families, or communities in this process. Now this was a deliberately conceived course of action. Consider the words of Duncan Campbell Scott, who was the head of the Department of Indian Affairs and the founder of the residential school. This quote comes from 1920. I quote, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. I do not think, as a matter of fact, that the country ought to continuously protect a class of people who are able to stand alone. Our objective is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic, and there is no Indian question and no Indian department. That is the whole object of this bill." End of quote. Rupert Ross comments on the residential school experience in his writings. He introduces the concept of genocide. I'll quote from Rupert Ross, quote, No discussion of the residential school system can be meaningful without acknowledging that this was an act of genocide. For those who value the importance of international law and the United Nations Convention of Genocide, a look at the UN definition itself was outlined in the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide adopted in 1948 is revealing. Article 2. In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. A. Killing members of the group. B. Causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. C. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. D. Imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group. E. Forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Arguably, Rupert says, all five of these criteria could apply to the residential school and other aspects of the Canadian government's colonization of Indigenous people. There can be no argument, however, that parts B and E apply. B being causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, and E forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Now, if you remember the definition, genocide means any of those acts. As Rupert points out, at minimum, two apply, possibly all five. Now, for those who experience residential school, the experience of trauma, as we have discussed, makes a psychological response, which can continue for years and which can worsen over time. Remember that components of the core experience of traumatization include being totally overwhelmed and powerless in the face of the source of the trauma, being utterly alone, unsupported, and disconnected from other people. This was residential school. Now, in addition to residential school, a number of additional experiences were part of the experience of colonization and trauma as experienced by First Nations people. As described by Rupert Ross, these include imposing past laws, 
where Aboriginal people were not permitted to leave their home reserve unless specifically permitted by the Indian agent. Imagine the impact that would have on your economy. Denying Aboriginal people the right to vote as long as they remain on their reservations as status Indians, a situation that prevailed until well after World War II. Making it unlawful for Aboriginal people to consult with a lawyer or bring suit against any government to enforce any treaty or other rights, a situation that existed until 1951. Making it unlawful for anyone to receive, obtain, solicit, or request any money to assist a band in any such claim against government. And making it punishable by jail for Aboriginal people to participate in certain traditional ceremonies. The experience of trauma through residential school and these other experiences was the direct result of public policy decisions by the Canadian government. Now, this is significant as it relates directly to our reaction to this experience. Now, Judith Thurman describes the reaction to trauma. And her words are quite profound, so I'll read her quote again. She says, and I quote, to study psychological trauma is to come face to face both with human vulnerability in the natural world and with the capacity for evil in human nature. To study psychological trauma means bearing witness to horrible events. When the events are natural disasters or acts of God, those who bear witness sympathize readily with the victim. But when the traumatic events are of human design, those who bear witness are caught in the conflict between victim and perpetrator. It is morally impossible to remain neutral in this conflict. The bystander is forced to take sides. It is very tempting to take the side of the perpetrator. All the perpetrator asks is that the bystander do nothing. The victim, on the contrary, asks the bystander to share the burden of pain. End of quote. Now, public policy decisions are of human design. When one's own government is the perpetrator, it creates a difficult situation, as governments seem to have the default standing of the benevolent public servant. It raises difficult questions. And acknowledging the pain, as Dr. Herman described, is sharing the burden of pain. And perhaps it's the shrinking from sharing the burden that makes conversations about colonialism and residential schools so difficult. But it does not change the reality, a reality that was the result of public policy decisions. Now we'll return to this later as we introduce our public policy framework for healing from trauma. Just like pause here, I'm seeing some questions about if the PowerPoint will be available to have. The whole webinar is being recorded. It will be posted on our website later. So returning to trauma. Once inflicted, trauma continues. As we mentioned before, trauma is particularly insidious as it can transmit between people and across generations. A report of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation describes this process. I'll quote from that report. Intergenerational trauma has been passed on for, for as many as seven generations through Aboriginal family and community systems. This trauma was inflicted on its victims in the form of physical and sexual abuse, abandonment, alcohol and drug dependency, suicide and loss, the withholding of intimacy and affection, persistent fear, lateral violence, racism and prejudice, and many other forms. Through these experiences, as role modeled by older generations to younger ones, a pattern of thinking and human interaction was learned that reflects the symptoms of post-traumatic stress and codependency. Among the behaviors that appear within the syndrome, family violence and abuse is the norm. Unless the present generation of parents are helped to see the roots of their own pain and to learn how to stop the cycle of abuse, and unless the children now living within abusive relationships receive focused therapeutic care to help them to heal from the trauma they have already experienced, the next generation will carry the abuse forward within a few short years and the pain will go on and on. End of quote. The experience of trauma transmits between people and across generations through the behavioral patterns the trauma creates, which in turn create additional traumas and a cycle of traumatic experiences that continue until the cycle can be broken. As an aside, breaking cycles of any type is another topic we should be paying a lot more attention to. Another description of trauma and its effects is described in detail 
by Wesley Eskimo and Smolescu in a report they produced. And again, I'll read their quote. There's a question, will treatments for trauma be discussed? The answer is yes. Quoting here, recurrent recollections of trauma experienced by individual members of the society will, sooner or later, enter into a social narrative of the group and become transmitted to next generations. They will enter into cultural collections of symbols and meanings, into rituals and ceremonies, into the group's shared cultural memory and into behavioral patterns. Relationships between people will be disturbed. Marriages will fall apart and children will be damaged. Some will be unable to express love or tenderness, being numb themselves, and they will raise numb, anesthetized children who are unable to express their emotions. The combined effect of numerous incidents of emotional abuse may lead to similar symptoms of repressed emotions, numbness, and the irrational thinking that comes with unresolved issues and loss of inherent identity. People will not respond to the world outside. They will perceive the world as hostile and beyond their control. They will feel alienated, detached, alone, and lonely. They will pass their loneliness and alienation on to their children, who will also become lonely and despairing. Their bodies will be the only things over which they will have control, and even then, the sense of control will be tenuous because of their own lifetime experiences. They will start abusing their bodies. They will drink themselves into oblivion. They will sniff glue and gasoline. They will cut their arms and they will kill themselves. They will not be able to love. Their helplessness will make them angry and they will beat and rape their wives and children and each other. Their children will not have the sense or the knowledge that they are reliving the past of their parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents. For them, the terror will be happening here and now. Abandoned and neglected, they will not see the future as anticipated opportunity. They will not see any future at all. This is not just a terrifying possibility. It is not a script for a futuristic horror movie. This is what happened and is still happening to generations of Aboriginal people in the Americas and beyond, just as it happened to other victims of genocide. This is happening now. End of quote. So let's summarize what we've discussed so far. Trauma, as defined by Dr. Herman, is an affliction of the powerless, overwhelming the ordinary systems of care that give people a sense of control, connection, and meaning generally involves threats to life or bodily integrity or a close personal encounter with violence or death, confronts humans with the extremities of helplessness and terror, and is a feeling of intense fear, helplessness, loss of control, and threat of annihilation. Trauma affects the body as its natural defense system gets overwhelmed and action is of no avail. And like an infectious disease, can transmit between people and even more insidiously across generations. Trauma is almost invisible, but its effects are far-reaching. Most of our healthcare system does not screen for it, count it, or treat it, yet it is a likely root cause for many of the issues we are struggling with. Trauma in a First Nations context was inflicted through the experience of colonization in residential school and has affected as many as seven generations. So let's switch gears and talk about healing from trauma. Given the impact and reach of trauma we have discussed, how does the healing process from trauma work? We'll first look at healing from a clinical perspective and then extend that into a public policy framework. Now as described by Dr. Herman, healing and recovery unfolds in three stages, in three stages. The central task of the first stage is the establishment of safety. The central task of the second stage is remembrance and mourning. The central task of the third stage is reconnection with ordinary life. Now, like any abstract concept or theory, these stages of recovery are a convenient fiction not to be taken too literally. Some discern five or eight stages to recovery. The three we focus on here are an attempt to impose simplicity and order upon a process that is inherently turbulent and complex. Now, the first stage focuses on the establishment of safety. This begins by focusing on control of the body and gradually moving outward toward control of one's environment. And controlling the environment includes the establishment of a safe living situation, financial security, mobility, 
and a plan for self-protection that encompasses the full range of the patient's daily life. Now, because no one can establish a safe environment alone, this always includes a component of social support. But from a health perspective, many of these are determinants of health. So it's quite interesting to see them in this context as well. An important part of healing from trauma involves reintegration of trauma memories of what happened into a verbal narrative format that allows it to become part of the victim's life story and experience, and thereby creates a psychological platform from which the victim can gradually process the feelings that accompany the trauma, understand what has happened, and eventually reconnect with the promise, with the process of her own life. Now, a prerequisite to this is a place of safety where this can occur. So establishing safety is the first stage. Now, one important aspect that increased control provides Aboriginal communities is time. Time to control their own destiny, free from the tension and the chronic stress of institutional racism and negative in external influences. As described by Wesley Eskimo and Smolescu, quote, Aboriginal people never had enough time between various sequences of New World epidemics, genocide, trauma, and forced assimilation to develop tools for passing through the periodic social and cultural disintegration of their nations. Aliens in their own land, under constant siege from their oppressors and separated from their own cultures, Aboriginal people slowly subsided into despair and a hollow silence, punctuated by tragic outbursts of self-defeating behavior." End of quote. So establishing safety is the first stage of any healing from trauma. The second stage focuses on remembrance and mourning. In this stage, the story of the trauma is told. The telling of the story works to transform the traumatic memory so it can be integrated into the survivor's life story. In a First Nations context, even though the conversation may be difficult, the story of residential school and colonization needs to be told as part of the healing process. In Canada, the story has begun to be told, but by and large, it is still misunderstood or unknown. Perhaps it is not so much the telling, but the listening ear that needs our help. The story needs to be part of the fabric of our country, as this is the only way for our country to heal and move forward. This is not an easy conversation. As described by Dr. Herman, she describes the experience of sharing the story, quote, She stands mute before the emptiness of evil, feeling the insufficiency of any known system of explanation. Survivors of atrocity of every age and every culture come to a point in their testimony where all questions are reduced to one, spoken more in bewilderment than in outrage. Why? The answer is beyond human understanding. End of quote. Now, it's helpful to remember, it's helpful to remember here that the purpose of telling the story is not to answer the terrible question of why, but to share the burden of the pain. The role of the bystander is to, to listen, to allow mourning to happen, and to bear witness to the story. Third stage focus, focuses on reconnecting. We remember helplessness and isolation are the core experiences of trauma. Therefore, empowerment and reconnection are the core experiences of recovery. It's the task of creating a future. Hope is a key ingredient here. We had a webinar on hope last week whose recording is up on our, our website. Now, reconnecting includes developing new relationships to people and to circumstances. Some even feel a call to engage with the world. These recognize the political or religious dimension in their misfortune and discover that they can transform the meaning of their personal tragedy by making it the basis for social action. While there is no way to compensate for an atrocity, there is a way to transcend it by making it a gift to others. Now, as healing progresses through these three stages, it is important to remember that resolution is never final. According from Dr. Herman, though resolution is never complete, it is often sufficient for the survivor to turn her attention from the tasks of recovery to the tasks of ordinary life. The best indices of resolution are the survivor's restored capacity to 
to take pleasure in her life and to engage fully in relationships with others. She's become more interested in the present and the future than in the past, more apt to approach the world with praise and awe than with fear. And also what happens is the transmission of trauma between people and across generations can stop. The cycle can be broken. And the survivors and cycle breakers honored for their courage and healing and their story never forgotten. Public policy. Why does healing from trauma, which is a very individual process and journey, need a public policy framework? It's a fair question and an important one to consider. I'd like to propose two reasons. First, in a First Nations context, residential school and many of the experiences of colonization were public policy decisions. Therefore, public policy has a responsibility and a role to play in creating a healing context and facilitating the healing process. A government apology, however well intended, is not enough. Neither are cash payments to survivors, but throwing money at a problem never solves it. And apologizing is only part of the process. Healing from trauma, especially trauma inflicted through public policy decisions, needs more. Second reason, while healing is an individual process and journey, there is an important role in the community and social sector. Public policy can help create a context where healing is more likely to happen and be more effective, and where barriers to healing can be reduced or removed, and where trauma itself can be less likely to happen, and if it does happen, its effects be less severe. So Equiate has developed a public policy framework to facilitate the healing of trauma. Now, as you listen to the description of the process of healing from trauma, some policy areas of focus may have suggested themselves to you. I'd like to make it clear here, this framework is brand new. It hasn't been applied or proven in any context. We're offering it here for the first time as a tool of possible benefit for those working to address trauma. We'll describe it in detail in a discussion paper that we'll be publishing fairly soon as well about trauma as a root cause, and we'll make it available on our website to everyone who registered for the webinar. Now, the essence of the public policy framework is as follows. The whole purpose of the framework, starting at the top, is that healing from trauma may occur by adjusting the policy levers and tools that can improve the components of context that public policy control. Now, this is done by viewing policy decisions through the lens of what is at the core of healing from trauma. One, empowering, empowerment and reconnection, and two, stopping the transmission of trauma between people and across generations. We propose four policy objectives consistent with the stages of healing described. So first, establishing safety. Second, remembrance and mourning. Third, reconnection. And fourth, we've added a fourth, which we call creating a future. Now, each of these policy objectives has specific public policies or policy outcomes that could be considered. For example, establishing safety includes a focus on many of the social determinants of health, such as income, housing, transportation, and social support. So what's the benefit of having a public policy framework of this kind? By making these explicit pieces of a policy framework, discussions and debates around these issues have this lens applied to them. For example, discussions about income, whether it be minimum wage, taxation rates, assisted living rates, welfare rates, or other types of discussion, can apply this perspective and consider potential scenarios based on their impact on the sense of safety and time required in the first stage of healing from trauma. This framework can help sensitize policymakers and advocates to trauma and its healing process, so their policy decisions can help healing happen rather than unintentionally throwing barriers or confusion into the healing process. As I mentioned, our policy framework is explored in its fullness in the discussion paper that we're finalizing to accompany today's webinar. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, trauma is a deep and difficult topic and deserving of much more attention than what we're able to give it in a one-hour webinar. I do hope you found what we covered interesting and are looking forward to exploring this further in your work. I'd like to take a pause now from our uh, presentation and open for questions and discussion for much of the time we have left.
Let me change the meeting options into discussion mode. All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star 6. So how we'll do the question and answer session is if you have a question that you'd like to ask or something you'd like to raise for discussion, uh, you can either type it into the, the chat window or if you raise your hand, remember if you go to the My Mood icon above the slide and click Raise Your Hand, I uh, will see your, your raised hand there. And if you're on the phone or if you have a good um, microphone for your computer, you could ask your question out loud too. We'll take a few minutes here for questions. The first question, this is from Alison Benedict from Toronto. Where do you get the reports or research papers that were reported on in the webinar? It's a great question. We'll have those included in our discussion paper, which will include a, a full and complete reference section. So you'll be able to see where all of those come from. Many of the ones from an Aboriginal context come from the many different reports that the Aboriginal Healing Foundation uh, has published over time. Second question from Marissa Rees. Regarding assessment, you mentioned the ACEs study as criteria for assessing trauma in children. What assessment tools are available for assessing trauma in adults? A great question. I'd like to open that one up for discussion. Does anybody have assessment tools for assessing trauma in adults that they use religiously? When I've read trauma and studied trauma, and if you have one, maybe you could type in uh, in your chat window there. When I've read trauma and studied trauma, um, assessment of trauma is very difficult, partly because the way trauma works is it affects your body. That disconnection that we referred to earlier, many symptoms appear that appear disconnected from trauma but really have trauma at their roots. So what often happens is somebody who has trauma first is treated for many of these symptoms until it becomes clear to um, their caregivers that something else is going on behind the scenes. So there's, there's quite a skill to diagnosing trauma in a clinical setting. We will be exploring assessment tools in our discussion paper as well, so we'll have uh, some commentary there. Another question from Frank Logue from Brampton. Have you looked at EMDR as a treatment tool? Um, yes, <laughs> I've personally uh, looked at EMDR, and uh, there's some interesting publications related to it. And, and as I indicated with the previous question, we'll be discussing assessment tools and some of these other treatment modalities in our discussion paper. The discussion paper we hope to have uh, completed and, and desktoped uh, within the next week or two. We'll publish it on our website and we will send an email out to everyone who registered for today's webinar, uh, giving them a link to the paper and also to the recording of today's webinar. Are there any additional questions anybody would like to ask? I saw Jennifer Wiedemann, you raised your hand. Uh, did you have a question you wish to, to type in or to ask? No, I didn't. I didn't mean to raise my hand. Sorry. No problem at all. <laughs> Computers are funny that way. They, they do things sometimes. Well, again, I'd like to thank you for your questions and interest today. We'll have opportunities to explore um, more questions in future conversations. Um, as I mentioned, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website and in our archives. I would like to mention a few things before we sign off. Um, here at Equiate, we have what we call our four-hour rule. And if you're familiar with Google, Google has a 20% rule. And how their 20% rule works is they give their engineers who develop their software uh, the freedom to focus 20% of their time on anything they want to that contributes to Google's overall mission and purpose. At Equiate, we've adopted the same principle. We call it our four-hour rule. So what it means is in any week, we dedicate at least four hours to having conversations with people who work 
trying to address health or social problems. Now, because of these webinars, we've dedicated that four-hour rule to follow-up conversations around these webinars. So what this means is if you found trauma to be an interesting topic or the public policy framework interesting and you'd like to explore it fur further, we're available, open, excited, and willing to have these conversations with you. The thing to do is my email address is there on the screen. It would be to send me an email, and then we can go ahead and, and book a time and, and have a conversation. They're completely free. It's just part of what we do and our work to help people who are working to solve health and social problems. And we also have a, a evaluation of today's webinar. It's a brief survey online, and I'll, I'll be sending it out to participants as well. If you don't mind taking the time to complete it, that would be appreciated. So it helps us to design our webinars and our topics in a way that is most helpful to those that participate in the webinars. So thank you again for your participation today. I look forward to future conversations with many of you about trauma as a root cause and the healing from trauma and public policy related to trauma. And I look forward also to possibly seeing you in our other webinars for those working to solve health and social problems. Again, my name is Steve Peterson with Equiate. And thank you for participating in today's webinar.